Hello developers, my name is Matt Rabel and I work for a company called Okta. Okta allows you to add authentication, authorization, and user management to your apps very quickly, very easily. You can find me on Twitter at mrabel. You can also find me on rabeldesigns.com, that's my blog that I started way back in 2002. You can find me on LinkedIn under mrabel. And today's blog post that will be developing is basically full stack reactive with spring webflux web sockets and react so i collaborated with josh long on this post and we wrote a few posts to precede it uh, one being getting started with reactive programming in spring and building reactive apis with spring webflux and so what i'm going to do today is i'm going to go through the building reactive apis part and then i'll go through this tutorial which actually uses react to build a real-time UI that talks to that backend uh, API, gets its information, displays it, and updates it automatically. So let's get started. I have a demo here that I use and you can find as well. So you'll see it's on Okta Developer, um, Okta Spring Webflux React Example is the name of the project. And then there's this demo.adoc in the React App directory on the React App branch that I'm using to do this. So I'm going to be using a number of IntelliJ Live templates. And these are basically shortcuts that I can use to just recall a bunch of code and not have to type it out uh, you know, very verbosely. So you can find the template definitions on GitHub at mrabel idea live templates. So you can see I just updated them an hour ago and uh, you should be able to use them if you import them to IntelliJ as well. So to begin, we're gonna start uh, with start.spring.io. So we could go to that site and uh, pick out data MongoDB Reactive, Webflux, DevTools, and Lombok. But I also have just an alias that you can see there that I've created for these. So let's move everything over here. And we'll go ahead with just Webflux start. So that downloads a demo.zip that has those dependencies in it. I'm going to create a Webflux React directory, cd into that, and then unzip this demo to Reactive Web. So if I cd into Reactive Web, I can open that up in IntelliJ. The API I'm going to create is just going to be a simple profile service that has a profile with an ID and an email and that's about it. Um, you can also persist them, save them to the database, add new ones, all that kind of stuff. So to begin, I'm going to create a profile entity object in the demo directory here. Call this profile. Then like I said, I'm going to be using live templates. So I have this webflux entity here and its profile. Then we'll also be creating a repository for it. So profile repository. Got to spell right, web flux repo. And so this extends from reactive Mongo repository, which has a number of CRUD methods, create, read, update, delete, to make it very easy to define our API. And I'm also going to have a sample data initializer. So this is just going to put some fake data or some basic data into our database. So you can see here it implements application listener, uses that profile repository, and when the application starts, first of all, it deletes all the records in the database and then it goes through and it basically uses a flux to add new profiles based on A, B, C, and D, um, random string, and then uh, that email. And then it does a find all and it subscribes and prints them out. So how reactive programming works a lot of times is you actually have to subscribe to the endpoint to get it to actually kick back information. So that's what we're doing there. And at this point, we should actually be able to start our application and see that information. So I'm going to set the demo as active profile here because we did specify that right here. Is this only kicks in, it only initializes when we're in a demo. 
you'll notice we're using Java 11 for this and it fails because it can't connect to MongoDB so the cool thing is this is reactive so most applications if you start them they can't connect to the database they fail well with reactive programming if the database happens to come available it'll actually go ahead and start it and connect to it so I'm just going to show this in a different window over here so if we do sudo mongod it starts up on the left there and actually down here it starts up as well so you can see that sample data initializer kicked in and it saved those profiles into the database so a rest api isn't that great if there's no api all right, so we still have to create that. We'll start by creating a profile service. This will act as our, our middleman between our controllers or our resources and our repository. So you can see here it's just a profile repository as a dependencies, also application event publisher that'll publish when we add new records. Um, and we can go down here and say comment that out because we're not worried about publishing new messages yet. So now that we have a profile service, we can create a profile rest controller. This is a classic Spring MVC style profile rest controller. So you can see here, this uses that profile service, injects it as a dependency, and we're using a different profile, we're using the classic profile. Um, if we call get all, we return a publisher. So that's how most of these work. Get by ID, same thing, returns a publisher for the profile. Uh, create, we'll go ahead and create a new one. Build it. And then the delete by ID, we'll call the service as well. And then update by ID, does something similar. So now we have that in place, we can go and modify this to be our classic profile and restart it. And now we should be able to hit that profile's endpoint. You can see we're getting that data back. And we can also do, I'm going to break this one off and minimize it. We can do things with HTTP, HTTP pi. I always say it wrong. HTTP pi. That's how you say it. You can go to profiles, and you can see them that way. You could also enter a new one. For instance, HTTP post to 8080 profiles. Email equals matt.rabel.octa.com. And if we look at our profiles again, you'll see it's been added. Um, we could also do a put um, to this ID and we could change the email for instance email equals memorable at gmail.com and now we look and see that that's been updated we could also delete it HTTP delete 8080 profiles and now it's gone. So you can see we have a full REST API using the traditional REST controller from Spring MVC. Uh, the basic difference is that we're you know, returning publishers instead of response entities. And so to do it more of the WebFlux way, um, we can actually create handler mappings and endpoint configuration. But before we do that, let's, uh, let's do this event stuff. So we're gonna create a profile created event okay just simple event that extends application event and then I'll create a profile created event publisher You can see here this uses a uh, executor. When the application event is received, it offers it up and then it accepts it and that executor goes ahead and publishes it. So once you have that in place, uh, we can 
update our profile service to actually on success of creating a new profile it will publish that event and now we can use the traditional webflex handlers so profile handler instead of the rest controller so this guy you can see class profile handler it's just a component uses that profile service to get the ID and read the response and here's the default write response and the default read response so it's just setting those to OK and uh, setting it to application JSON and doing it in a Webflux way. The other thing we need is a profile endpoint configuration to map this class or this handler so profile endpoint configuration you can see this specifies the route so it says for profiles go to that all handler profiles ID it uses the method handles to go to that handler and those specific methods so that's all pretty straightforward we also need to create this case insensitive request predicate so um, we actually doesn't matter if we do uppercase or lowercase profile or even have a mix of characters. So this guy is pretty straightforward. It's just how you do request predicates uh, with Webflux. So you can see here it uses this lowercase URI server request wrapper and uh, just lowercases everything. So case doesn't matter. So once we have that in place, we can go ahead and restart and make sure we're using demo instead of classic. Now we can try that profiles endpoint again, make sure that works. Yep. And if we were to do HTTP profiles, that all still works. Now we're using the handler instead of the REST controller. I'm also going to create a uh, WebSocket that shows when these new profiles are created. So I'm going to do that by creating a WebSocket configuration class. WebSocket configuration. Guess uppercase WebSocket. So this is what defines that executor that the publisher is looking for and then we have this handler mapping that just maps WS profiles endpoint WebSocket handler adapter and this basically from that publish it maps the uh, source of the event which is a profile and just returns it as a JSON object so that's what this session send does with that message flux so now what we can do is we can create a WebSocket page, so a client per se. So we'll call this static ws.html. And this is just a simple HTML page that uses a standard WebSocket to talk to localhost 8080 WS profiles. And when it gets a new message, it'll basically tell you. So um, we can create a new bash script that'll create these uh, these profiles for us so you can see here it just picks a random uh, email and appends a letter onto it and posts it so it doesn't really depend append a letter it just uh, uses random so now we can open a terminal window uh, we probably want to restart everything Now we can run this create and we'll navigate this one to ws.html. Really don't see anything there, but when we run this, you will, right? There's a, there's a new message from the server. You can do it again and there you are. And then if you want to see if those have been added to the list of profiles, you see they have. 
So the other thing we can do is create a server sent event. So server sent event controller. And this guy uses a flux of the profile created event. And you'll see we have that publisher and we're sharing it so we can access it and get those messages. And then an object mapper just from uh, Jackson to do the taking a profile and turn it into a JSON object. The path is SSE slash profiles. You have to have this media type or it won't work. And then we're just returning a flux of strings. So as the events come in, it's just gonna write those out for us. So now we can restart again. And now we can open up a connection to HTTP 8080 SSE profiles dash S. And so now it's listening for new profiles coming in. If we create them, you'll see there they are. So we have service and events working. We have WebSockets working. We have Spring WebFlux. Now let's turn to React and create a React app that talks to this. So I have uh, a few shortcuts to make this simpler. Uh, the first one is I have two aliases, so let's uh, let's look at create React app aliases. Oh, alias CRA. So that one I use npx create React app and then whatever I pass into it. Uh, the other one I have is ts, which adds the TypeScript dependencies. So create React app 2.0 and above basically allows you to simply add TypeScript and then it'll recognize TypeScript in your project and as long as you have these dependencies everything will work. So I can do create React app, uh, call it React app. And then I can do yarn start. Oh, we aren't in the app. You have to be in the app. So you are and start here. You can see that's the very basic React app that you can generate. So back to our tutorial here. So now I'm going to add the TypeScript support. So this is CRATS as my alias. Now we can open this directory up in IntelliJ as a separate app. And so I'm going to start by just modifying this app.js. I'm going to make it into a TypeScript file. So rename and TSX. And then I'm going to add a component did mount. So I have a shortcut for that called React Fetch. So this is going to hit localhost 3000 and the profiles endpoint and then it's going to set the state of profiles and is loading to false after that happens. So to make it, this all work we're going to create a couple interfaces. So interface profile, this is going to match what's on our server so ID is a number, email is a string, and then we're also going to have app uh, props. Or interface app props. It's just going to be empty for now. Then interface app state. And in the state, we're going to have those profiles. And it's array of profile. And then is loading is a boolean. Okay. And then because we're using TypeScript, now we have to put these in on the class signature. So app props state and now we need to specify those in a constructor initialize it to basically not have any data in the beginning so profiles is empty and is loading is false you have to call super when you do this so now we have all that um, we can go into the render method and change first of all we have to have a way of telling people it's loading right so this basically grabs the profiles and is loading from the state 
and then if it is loading it just shows the loading messages right no reason to show the rest of this so then in here I can change this to a list the list of our data that comes back so uh, profiles dot map and it's going to be a profile object and then we'll put a title of profile list here so now you can see we're going to render that h2 at the profile list and this is how you basically do looping uh, in react where you map it and then you have to have a key and then we'll display that actual email so to make all this work you notice we're going to localhost 3000 so this isn't going to work right away because 3000 is actually the react app but what you can do to get around cross origin resource sharing and trying to talk to localhost 8080 is create a proxy so this is just going to proxy everything from localhost 3000 uh, or the endpoint to uh, 8080 so now we can start this app you'll see it detected TypeScript in the project now it's going to reload everything and we should have our list of profiles okay so now we're getting those from the server side so if we wanted to we could go to our server and restart it so we don't have those random ones in there So we'll just go ahead and restart it. All right, and now we just have those basic four. So we can go back to our React app. And now the next thing I'm going to do is basically turn what we have in app.tsx into its own component called profile list. So we can actually copy this, call it profile list and then we'll just rename everything that's app to profile list so profile list place that one that one that one that one that one and we can actually delete all this stuff because we just have the profile list that's all we want to show all right so make that look a little better and then replace our last one so now we have a profile list and we don't need CSS because we're not using any of it in this particular class. We can go back to app and revert everything right, to what it was in the beginning. And then we can just say, hey, this is our profile list. So I believe this really shows like the power of React and how you can easily grab a component and you know reference it from another component. So everything's still working over here. The next steps we or that I want to make is to basically show you the different techniques for getting the data from Spring Webflux. And so the first most primitive way is to actually use an interval. And so this basically will fetch new data every second or so and show it. The problem is it's going to fetch all the data, right? So React interval is my shortcut and I'm going to add an interval up here. So we can set that and expire it. So you'll see here this fetch data method sets a state to loading as true and then it goes ahead and fetches those profiles and then just gets it back, right? Very similar to what we had before. Um, but the component did mount is the one that calls that fetch data and then it sets that interval to happen every second. And then when the component unmounts, it clears that interval. So that's why we set it to a local variable. So if we were to go back to our app, you can see a nice error that says cannot find global value promise. So that's because it did create this TS config for us, but it's still not targeting uh, ES6. So we can do lib and ES6 and DOM, and that will fix this problem. You do have to restart the app though because you are modifying the compilation settings. So in the instructions in the demo here, you'll see that I expected that, I knew it might happen. So if you need those values, you can grab them there. And so now you'll see it's kind of janky, right? We're getting that screen flicker um, because it is refreshing that data every second. So that's not a great experience, but we can, we can still create a stream. So 
let's add a new script that creates a stream of data. So this script basically uh, will post for 120 seconds a new random profile as long as it's just running. So if I run create stream, you'll see it's posting one. You can see those do get added when it refreshes, but still it's fetching the whole list, so it's not super performant. The next way I want to show you is to use RxJS. So you can actually do uh, yarn add RxJS. And we want to shut this down since we're adding a new dependency. Now that we have that, we can go in here and change these three methods to just be a single component did mount. So this is very similar to the last one. We have to import some, some things here to start with. And then take this out and now import that. So you'll see up here, the imports that it added are all from RxJS, start with, switch map, and interval. And what this does is it starts with the interval of saying, hey, every second, go ahead and, and pipe that and start with zero. So this will fetch right away as soon as the component mounts. And then this switch map will fetch it every one second beyond that. And then this request.subscribe, you often need with observables, just like with Webflux, to actually get that data and then it sets the data locally and sets is loading to false. So we should be able to start this. And whether you use npm start or yarn start doesn't really matter um, as long as you have both installed on your system. So that takes a little while to compile. And now you'll see if we start adding new records again, it'll start appending those at the bottom. But it's also not as janky, right? It's kind of a smooth uh, adding of them. So uh, better than interval, but still not great because it is actually fetching all of those records and replacing every single one of them. So the next thing I want to show is WebSockets. So with WebSockets, I have a shortcut for that. So this uses that component did mount as well. Uh, what this does is the first time it'll actually fetch all the records, right? And then uh, and then it adds this event listener for more messages coming in. And then as those come in, it'll just push the new one onto the profiles and sets the state of profiles. So this is a bit more performant because it's not making requests and getting the whole list back. It's just doing that once in the beginning and then it's listening for new events to get added. So I'm going to restart the server so we have less data. So you see we just have those four records. Now if we start creating a stream, it'll just add the new ones as they're added. Maybe I forgot to save this. Yep, so back to the server. Let's restart that one more time. So we don't have all that data in there. This is what happens when the server is down. Um, that's just because I haven't done any error handling in the app. Uh, so now you have those. And if you create the stream, We'll start adding those as well. Why is it not working? So let me debug this and I'll come back in a minute and tell you why it's not working. Ah, simple. So I missed step six here, which basically uh, the proxy mechanism right here does not proxy web sockets. So what you have to do is you have to create a setup proxy.js in the source directory. And then you'll see you can use HTTP proxy middleware 
to actually set WS to true. So I believe that might be an issue that will be solved in Create React App and how you can configure in package.js or JSON, but uh, right now this is the workaround for that. So um, you do have to restart everything and we'll restart our server as well just so we have less data. So the back end's probably not up. Now it is. And now we can do our create stream again. And the web sockets will start showing up there. So that's all working as long as you have your proxy set up OK. So the last thing I want to show you is with event source. All right? So in, uh, in this profile list, instead of using web sockets, we can use event source. So react event source. And this one is similar. You can see we're going to 3,000 profiles. We're getting that response. But this is the big difference right here. We actually can't proxy that I found event sources with Create React App. So um, I actually have to go to 8080 SSC profiles and then use event source to handle the on message. And I added this one in here because. Um, it really helped me figure out this problem because I would get the open message, but I'd never get the on message. So it turned out that the proxy was the problem or the lack of proxy. So to fix this or to work around it, what you can do is on the server side, you can add a cross origin annotation here on the server sent event profiles. And we'll just specify that origins is HTTP localhost 3000 and then restart it and now our app will be able to connect both on 3000 profiles using that proxy and on 8080 SSE profiles so we could have went and added you know a cross origin annotation here as well and accomplish the same thing so now if we go back to create react app is this guy still running yep okay so we just have those and now if we do create stream the event source will work just like the web sockets where when a new one comes in it actually grabs that and publishes it so that's all working the next thing I want to show you is how to authenticate with Okta or how to add authentication in so a lot of the tools in this are actually spring security uh, at least on the, the server side so in my pom.xml I can start by adding some dependencies so these are the dependencies I added. Spring Boot Starter Security, OAuth2 Client, OAuth2 Resource Server, and OAuth2 Jose, which is for JWTs, also called JOTs, or JSON Web Tokens. So once I have that in place, I can go into the resources directory, rename this application.properties to application.yaml, just because I like YAML a bit better. And so these are the properties. You'll see here there's an issuer URI that I've created with my Okta account, client ID, client secret, and then these are all the spring properties. So you have an issuer URI for OIDC, and then you have a client ID, a client secret, the scopes, or you can leave these out because I believe these might be the defaults, and then a resource server, which I'm actually not going to use yet. But just to show you how you might create similar settings, if you go to developer.okta.com, click sign up, then you just have to fill out a few fields. Um, these are optional down here, but email, first name, last name, company. Um, I already have an account, so I'll just go ahead and log into, say, this one here. And I don't even know my password. I just store in one password. And then sign in. And then you'll go to applications, add an application, and you'll basically do a web application because it's spring security and the server side and you could call it you know web flux demo and then this will need to match um, a specific value in Okta and then uh, you can do implicit if you want to have react use that to get to it and that's what I'll use today but I'm actually going to use a different application that I already have configured let me show you that one so reactive web here and you'll see this has authorization code 
enabled, also implicit. This is because on the client side, I'm going to use React and actually log into Okta and then send an access token to the server side. And so I need to have implicit enabled to do that. And then you'll see the login redirect URIs. This is what you need for Spring Security and its OIDC support with Okta. And then this is for a uh, tool that I'm going to use to get an access token and then this is for my react app so I've already configured all those and the tutorial that I referenced does have all these values in there um, so once you have those you should be good to go I'll just log out here so when I try to log into the app it doesn't automatically sign me in so I have those guys and now what I can do is actually start things up again so first of all enable auto import so IntelliJ grabs them. Uh, one thing I did want to show you is if you're typing Spring Boot Run all day, you can actually go into the build configuration of your POM and specify a default, default goal of Spring Boot Run. So once you have that in place, you could easily, you know, if you didn't want to use your ID and you want to use the terminal, you could just run MBN. And it'll run that default goal. And the Spring team likes to use tabs instead of spaces. I like spaces. So IntelliJ knows me well. So if you see this using generate security password, you know it's picked up the spring security dependencies. And then if you go to localhost 8080 profiles, it'll actually redirect you to login. And it'll come back to your app and show you all the profiles in there. So we have the server side protected now, um, but you'll notice it does a redirect. So um, that only works if you're coming from the browser. We also want to make it possible to send an access token from React. So let's go and add OIDC support or authentication to React. So I have a couple shortcuts here as well. Um, first of all, yeah, I'll just follow my steps so I don't get out of order. I'm going to create a security configuration for Spring Security. And the reason I'm doing this is because this is necessary if you want to have, like I have, where it redirects to Okta if you try to access 8080 profiles and allows a resource server, which means you can accept an access token and not do a redirect. So for this to work, um, you basically enable WebFlux Security enable reactive method security. I'm not going to actually use that in this demo, but if you want to have like pre-authorized annotations like that on your methods, you would need that annotation. And then unlike uh, Spring MVC where you extend a class, this just has a bean for the web security filter chain. And so I start by enabling CSRF and uh, specifying it in a cookie uh, so the, the React client could read it and send it back. And then authorize exchange, we're going to permit uh, WebSockets and the reason for that is because WebSockets don't or I wasn't able to get it to work with an authorization header so um, we're gonna allow WebSockets to come in without any sort of authorization and then I'll change the WebSocket publisher so it only publishes an ID and then the client will take that ID and refetch so it's the best that I could do as far as making the server side secure and still using WebSocket. So I think our socket is going to be a, a good solution in the future and I reference it in the blog post and give links to the Spring Security or the Spring Framework issues for supporting WebSocket. So I don't think it's quite there yet, um, but I do have some examples in the repo if you want to go try it out. And so this OAuth2 login is what does the redirect and then this OAuth2 server uh, JWT right here is what handles specifying the resource server. So to make the resource server work in this application YML you need that resource server and the issuer specified here. So then there's also this cores configuration source that configures cores for everything. So it allows credentials, it sets allowed origins to 3000. This basically allows us to make any requests from the client and uh, directly to the server. So that's all configured. We can go ahead and restart the server side. And then we can go back to the client, the React app. And first of all, we'll make sure nothing's running. And I have a couple uh, aliases for installing uh, Okta React. So I just do Okta React. And that adds um, Okta React, React Router DOM, and then it adds the TypeScript support for React Router DOM.
or the types. So once you have this in place, you can go into this app.tx. First of all, we'll add the config. So this uses the config right here. Um, my same settings, the same client ID, and then it has this interface for auth to log in, log out, check if it's authenticated, and get the access token. And then I can change this to be React Security. And so you'll see we specify the security from that config, and then we go to a home component first since we're not able to use this one. And then we have that implicit callback that's going to come back and, and handle the Okta login. So you'll notice there's, a, there's an error here that it can't find any TypeScript support in this. So to work around that, we can declare module Okta, Okta React, and that solves the problem. So now you'll see there's no more underlines. We can clean up our imports there. And uh, now we're getting somewhere. So let's create the home TSX. This uses that profile list. You can see it down here, but it passes the auth in there too. So we actually have to go into the profile list and specify in the props auth. Then import that. See if I can import correctly. There we go. Clean up the imports there. Nope, I'm fine with IntelliJ doing what it's doing. So now that we have that, if we look at home, you'll see that it uses this with auth higher order component. So that's part of the Okta SDK. You can see it right there. And then it sets the authenticated state, check authentication comes down to here. And so this is what does all that authentication checking. And then we have login and log out. And it renders the button. So if you're authenticated, it renders a logout button with the profile list. If you're not authenticated, it just renders a login button. And that's it. And so that body is then specified down here. So now the last thing I want to do is just give the buttons a bit more padding. So just give them a margin top and make their font size a bit bigger. And then we can go ahead and yarn start. And I believe this will fail, but it might succeed. We'll see. Yep, it failed because I forgot the import. Such a small thing. Okay, now it says welcome to React. So if we click login, it'll redirect us to Okta, but since I'm already logged in, it actually came back right away. So the reason that it failed is because in profile list, we're not sending an access token. So if we change this to the original React fetch, You'll see it's very simplistic, right? It just goes to profiles, and you'll see it gives us the same information or the same error when it fails to compile, right? So what we need is to pass in an access token. So this is the syntax for that. You can see we're hitting that profiles endpoint, and we're passing in the header, and we get that access token from the Okta React SDK. And so now it's working, it's pulling all those in. But, like I said, uh, this isn't a great performance mechanism because it's fetching all of the records, right? Instead of just the one that's been added. So we can change our WebSocket configuration to just pass back the ID. So instead of writing this whole thing as a string, we'll just start with, uh, with doing profile. cast it from an event that gets source to a profile and then we'll create a map that's just string string call it data and then we can go ahead and put the ID in there and then return object mapper 
write value as string and just put data in there. So now we'll just be getting the ID back. And then what we can do on the client, well, first of all, we we'll want to restart this. On the client, we can use WebSockets again. And so the difference here is we're still going to be making that original request to profiles, right, with that access token. But then this WebSocket request is going to be unsecured. Um, but we're only getting the ID, so I don't think that's, that's terrible, right? Um, so we'll get that ID from this event.data, and then here's the ID that we'll pass in, and we'll pass in those headers again, and then we can basically push that new object that comes back on there. So um, a little chatty, and I think our, our socket will, will solve this, but from what I've seen, it's not quite ready yet. Um, let's see. So now... Uh, to create a stream, we actually have to go, we can use this OIDC debugger. So it's already got some information in here that it kept from my last session. And since I have implicit flow enabled, it'll allow me to, to get an access token this way. So once I have an access token, I can go into this create stream and I can say access token equals this guy. And then as far as HTTP post, I can do authorization bearer and access token. And now I should be able to run create stream and it'll work. I've seen this error a few times. You see that? It says invalid token. This ISS claim is not equal to the configured issuer. I really dug into that and figured out why. But I know that if I restart, it should work this time. And there you see it's actually creating the records and they're showing up here. So there you have it. I hope you've enjoyed this, uh, this demo of React WebSockets and Spring WebFlux. If you want to learn more uh, about this, I suggest you subscribe to the Okta developer blog. Um, you can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash octadev. So whenever we post new tutorials or new things on our blog, we always post a tweet as well. Thanks for listening, and I hope you have a great day.